is Paul has finished his third missionary journey. He has come back to Jerusalem, got arrested uh, when some some Jewish uh, haters that were not liking their fellow Jewish brother because he was he was sharing Christ. Uh, they created a stink for him, uh, and then because of the the threat of a riot. Uh, the Roman guards come in there and, and snatch him up. They go to whooping on him. Paul says, uh, it's not, is it lawful for you to whoop a Roman citizen? And they didn't realize he was Roman because he was looking just Jewish. Remember the, the complexities of the time is that you have the Roman government overseeing the Jewish government overseeing the Jewish people. And so here's Paul as he is uh, Jewish he, they didn't recognize he was also a citizen of Rome, which was not maybe all that common there in Judea. Uh, and so when they, when he said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, they panicked like, oh my, now we're in trouble because we were whooping without a trial on a Roman citizen. Paul used this to get out of the sticky situation he was in in Jerusalem. They would have going to kill him in Jerusalem. In fact, they set up a, a a scheme by which they were going to kill him and get him murdered. But Paul's nephew spreads the word uh, and gets him out of Jerusalem down to Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea by the sea. It was the, the largest seaport there uh, on the Mediterranean. It was created by Herod the Great, uh, and it's still there. We'll see that in May. Uh, it's still there. And Paul was there uh, in captivity, basically, and he's brought before Felix, the procurator, uh, the Roman official that is kind of keeping, he's the overseer of, of uh, Judea. When I say Judea, just know that we're talking about the southern part of Israel. So today, this is just an interesting little side note. Today, depending on who you're talking to, will determine uh, what words they use for Israel. Uh, some will call it Palestine. I don't call it Palestine. That's a that's a political word, and it never uh, it, it's not accurate. Uh, Palestine was connected to it falsely later on by someone say, "Well, it was the Philistines," so they connected it to in the in its areas that are called Palestinian, and that would be the Arabs, and so that would be. Uh, I mean, even today we have the Palestinian authorities, and this is a, like I said, it's a political word. If you're talking to a Jewish person, they will call it Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria. Uh, remember, Judea is the southern part of Israel. It's split off into several different uh, pieces when you get into parts of Israel. Yes, it's a little politically com complicated. Uh, there are parts of the West Bank that you can go into and the parts that you don't go into. And uh, cause there's like three different, um, I can't remember what types of zones. Anyway, we were there in Nazareth and we were gonna drive down to Jerusalem and I, I rented a car and take out the old Google and let's go down to Jerusalem. Look, it's a straight shot. So I start driving down to Jerusalem. I come to a checkpoint and uh, Guard comes to my car and says, and I hear, I got my kids in there with me. And he's like, oh, where are you going? Is it Jerusalem. He's like, do you realize you're driving into the West Bank? I said, no, I do not. He said, yeah, you don't want to turn around, don't you? I said, yes, I do. So <laughs> turned around with a different route. Now, we were there a few years ago and I uh, wanted to go to a place called Caliber 3. Caliber 3 is a very cool place. It's uh, anti-terrorism, <laughs> self-defense firearms, hand-to-hand, -hand, all that cool training goes on at Caliber 3. It's in West Bank. And uh, we had an Airbnb, and, and I called up Caliber 3. I said, hey, how, how am I supposed to get in there to you? You're in the West Bank. Oh, it's not that big of an issue. Just come on through. I'm in a rental car. Usually when they see those license plates, there's yellow and there's white, if I remember right. And if it's the wrong license plate, they'll stone your car and... I'm like, I'm not, I'm, this is a rental. They said, yeah, it's a different part. So certain parts is complicated. You don't, don't, don't go into Gaza. You just don't. 
you can go into Bethlehem. It's a little heightened security. I don't like going into Bethlehem. Honestly, we go. Uh, but there's you just feel the tension, feel the darkness. Bethlehem has been walled off. And you go through checkpoints. And I get pulled off the bus every time. And Christy tells me, take your sunglasses off, smile at them. It don't matter. They're going to pull me off. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why, but they pulled me off. Uh, but anyway, it's complicated this day, today in Israel. It's not unsafe. Uh, have people ask all the time about going to Israel? Is it, is it unsafe? Well, it's a little bit unsafe, I say. But once you clear DFW airport, you're going to be all right. So <laughs> from here to DFW, it's a little sketchy. But, uh, <laughs> but once you get there, it's safe. We are going this, this year, we're going in May to Israel. We have a full trip and a waiting list afterwards. And I recognize that how many people want to go to Israel was more than we're able to go. So we're going to go next year. So if any of you want to go to Israel with us next year, start planning now. We're going to go. So anyway, with the complexities of today, uh, it was way more complex in this day because you had one, uh, one overseeing government over the nation of Israel and over their government. And so one would play against the other. And that's what you're seeing here with Paul. And so Paul is on trial. And Felix, the procurator, who is the, the Roman He's been brought this prisoner, and so Paul then is kind of in court listening, uh, and there's just back and forth. Let's look at verse 23. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So this is what we were studying last time we were covering the scriptures, that there is Felix and his wife Drusilla, who is Jewish. She has some knowledge about the way. The way was the, the name for Christians at that time. And uh, it comes from Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so there they are, Felix and Drusilla are now going to listen to Paul concerning faith in Christ. It was nothing... Uh, it, it, they had heard of, you can imagine if you were in that region that you've heard of these people. They've heard of people being raised from the dead, people having their sight restored, lame being uh, risen to walk, and then they've heard of the crucifixion and the resurrection of, of Christ. And so they've heard these people. Drusilla, being Jewish, married to a Roman procurator, knew a little bit about this, and so they want to listen to Paul. But there was some motive behind listening to Paul. Verse 25, now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now, I thought last time as we touched on it, I thought we would get a little further than we actually got last time, but we only got to the first point. That was righteousness. And what is righteousness? And you would think that's a pretty straightforward question. What is righteousness? And and most people think that righteousness is being holy, that is being perfect and, 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 and not doing anything wrong, uh, but that's not actually accurate. Righteousness uh, is right standing with God. So Jesus told his followers, unless, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, I'm sure that this was a shocker to him because the scribes and the Pharisees, man, they, they had every detail. They would strain out their grain in order to make sure a bug wasn't in there because a bug was unclean and then they were no longer righteous. And so they were pretty strenuous when it came to the law. And so Jesus comes along and says, you got to do better than those guys. And I'm sure everybody's like, well, this is impossible to do better than those guys. But see, those guys were basing their righteousness on their selves, on their own actions. And that's not righteousness at all. That's self-righteousness. And you can't even by the best behavior become actually righteous. There's only one righteousness that you can actually have. 
and that is imputed righteousness. Imputed means put on you. Imputed means put on you. So this word imputed, when Christ died on the cross, uh, he died for the sins of the world. Well, when I put my faith in Christ, it is as my sins were laid upon him and paid for. But then what I really struggled with for a long, long time is this imputed righteousness, that his righteousness was put on me. And so 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Imputed righteousness. It's not of your own works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, is by grace you have been saved, not of works, not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. It's not of your own righteousness. It's his righteousness. And so it is by faith in him that we've been made righteous. Amen? So you can see how last time we got hung up on righteousness for the entire time because I love talking about it. How are we made righteous? The same way Abraham was made righteous. And his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. Amen? So by faith in Christ Jesus, we are considered then in right standing with God. And so we need to have right believing in our own right standing, and it will lead to right living. Just think on that for a second. If we have right believing about our own right standing, it will lead to right living. In other words, I'm not going to continue to live in sinfulness if I, if I recognize the price that has been paid for my salvation. And, and, and so it, it's, I'm not going to re-preach it. I talked plenty on it last time. Um, but it's just I love talking about grace and his righteousness. Well, the next point was Self-control, that's the one that I thought was very interesting. Paul talked to him, Felix, about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Well, that's interesting, because why, why that topic? Of all topics, I get righteousness and the judgment to come. But he must have known something about this man, Felix. He must have known something about this man, Felix. Uh, let's just talk about self-control for a little bit. Um, when I am in the spirit, I got a lot of that. Self-control. When I'm in the flesh, I don't. Maybe in some areas I do, in some areas I don't. Uh, depending on what your area of weakness is. But when I'm in the spirit, and why is that? Say that again. It's the, fruit of the spirit. it's the fruit of the spirit. So how do I gain self-control? Well, I need to really work on that. I need to really work on self-control. No, you need to walk in the spirit. That's, see, that's the difference. Walk in the spirit, you're not fulfilled the lust of the flesh. How do I gain self-control? I don't work on it because that's works and you aren't saved by works and you're not gifted by works. It's a gift of fruit. And so... We need to walk in the Spirit. And, and, and in that fellowship with the Lord, in that unity with the Lord, it comes as a byproduct. Amen? Those are side effects I like. <laughs> that's, a, that's a side effect of walking in the Spirit, self-control. There's a song or a proverb, a proverb that says, A man without self-control is like a city with the wall broken down. And... If you think about a walled city and just dial your mind back in time to back when that was fortification and how um, they would besiege a city. And so just imagine the medieval age or whatever, you're going back in time and you're thinking about this walled city. Do they have to take down all the walls for the enemy to come in? No, nah, just a little. And so to have... No self-control is to have your defenses broken down. It don't have to be that you have to have all of them broken down. But in a in particular area, the enemy can come in. And, uh, and when he comes in, of course, he's going to bring, he's going to bring trouble with him. So Paul says, he, first he talks about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Let's look at some verses of Scripture on self-control. Let's look at... Uh, 
as our sister Tara said, Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, you back up to verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what's that final one? Self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And so, on this topic of fruit of the Spirit, the final one is self-control. And Paul says, let us walk in the Spirit. Now, also notice what it, he added in there. Uh, let's just back up, actually. Let's back up to chapter 5, verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 16. I do want to encourage you to bring your Bible uh, on Wednesdays because we dig in. Chapter 5, verse 16. I say, then walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you, and a commentary on verse 17 would be Romans chapter 6, when Paul says, the things I want to do, I can't do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. O wretched man that I am, who will, who will redeem me from this body of sin? And then he gives us the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. So Paul is saying, that if I'm walking in the flesh, though, I'm not fulfilling those things that, that are spiritual. So what verse am I on? Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Whole nother, we, we've already talked about, we are righteous outside of the law. We're made righteous by faith in his grace. Amen? Not of works, Ephesians 2, 9. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 19. Now the, what's the next word? Works. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and in case we haven't covered it, and stuff like that. <laughs> That's what it says. And the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Works of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I used this illustration before, I think. There are factories that make uh, artificial fruit. I mean, I've seen some pretty good artificial fruit. Like, you want to pick it up and eat it. And you go by those factories and they're belching out smoke and there's machines running and there's guys working and, and it's popping out these artificial fruit. And, and they look good, but don't try and eat one. I mean, there's, there's work going on, work going on, work going on but it's all artificial. But have you ever walked by an orchard and hear, if you ever walk by an orchard and hear grunting, like that tree's going, <laughs> so, pop down fruit. <laughs> no, because there's no work involved. It's a natural process. It's a natural process. What is required for fruitfulness? This is a good, I think we'll... I, we might finish this chapter tonight. I think I'm fixing a reroute tonight. What is necessary for fruitfulness? How many of y'all have heard of the Asbury Revival? Asbury Revival is a Asbury College in which uh, the Holy Spirit has poured out on the students there at that college. And it, it started off with 24-7 worship. And... Uh, it becomes a great topic of discussion amongst preachers and Christian folk and those who have who've looked in revival for a long time. It becomes a great topic. So having a conversation with some pastors the other day, and is it a real revival? And we can really get into the splitting of the hairs over titles and words and 
And uh, I don't really get into all that. I'm like, it's a move of God. It's an obvious move of God. One of them uh, uh, made a point, and it's a good point, that we know we have experienced a revival years after the fact because of a lasting cultural effect. There'll be something changed in the culture. And that's, that's, a good, that's a good thought. Just think on that. You know that there has been an awakening. And we had the great awakenings in America. There was a cultural change. The, the, the Welsh revival in the country of Wales, uh, it so affected that country. The miners had to retrain their donkeys because they weren't using foul language anymore. And the donkeys didn't know what to do. <laughs> they had to retrain their donkeys. The courts shut down because there were no more cases. Crime stopped. That's a cultural change. That's a real revival. So the question is, well, do we know about Asbury? Is this a real revival? And, uh, we call it all kinds of things, outpouring, awakening, whatever you want to call it. How do we know that there will be a cult? How can we, how can we steward this is the question for us, church. How can we steward a move of God in order that there will be fruitfulness, cultural change? What happens, what, what is from, a, from an outpouring to fruitfulness, what, what is there? Time. Time. There's time. And so let's say, all right, tomorrow we're going to get a rain. There's a lot of gardens been planted already. Tomorrow we're going to get an outpouring. Well, well, Friday, will we be picking fruit? Not unless it's onions or potatoes, you know, and then you're picking them a little green. <laughs> so some of y'all are like, really? Onions, potatoes? Well, it's, it's a little early for fruitfulness. It's a little early. So what must we do is we protect the atmosphere. I use this illustration a lot uh, in, in regards to discipleship. I've, I have grown a lot of corn in the bed of my truck. You know, y'all have heard me use this illustration. Many of you have heard me use this illustration because it has all of the elements for growing corn. It's dirty. In deer season, as I'm putting out deer corn, it's going to spill in the bed of my truck. There's dirt. It's going to get rained on, and I will have corn sprouting up. I mean, I've had like a gallon of deer corn just left in the bed of my, and I mean, it'd be a nice green. I mean, it'd look beautiful. I've, I've grown a lot of corn in the bed of my truck, but I have never harvested corn in the bed of my truck. Why? I have all the right elements, but not the right atmosphere. It's not the right atmosphere. It's not the right uh, protected climate. There's not a long enough season of growth. It, it, it wasn't the right el uh, the environment, not the right environment. So God's been moving at Sand Springs. He has been for a while now. We've seen fruitfulness. Why? Because we've been going at this thing for a little while. What must happen to move from just an outpouring to fruitfulness? What has to happen? You have to protect the environment. You have to protect the environment. You have to ensure that all the right elements continue and the environment protected or this could all go away quickly. Right? Have y'all seen it before? I've seen it before. That a move of God happened in a particular church or school or whatever, Christian school, college, university. And things were rocking along for a little while, and then, then it just went away. It just stopped. Uh, no lasting effect, no major change. And so we, we have to ask ourselves about fruitfulness. Will there be fruit in my life? Christians, that's a question we need to be asking ourselves. It was not enough that you got saved. That's, I mean, that's awesome. You're going to make heaven, praise God. But that wasn't the purpose for which he saved you was just to make heaven. 
He saved us for fruitfulness. So what must happen? I need to make sure the elements that are necessary for growth continue to happen. And I make sure I protect and I steward the environment and that eventually a natural product will be fruit. Amen. If you're walking close to the Lord, you'll have to backslide not to see people get saved. <laughs> Y'all follow me? Because I know some folks that, you know, they have never taught, they have never been taught evangelism. They've never been taught, you know, all of these things on how to do anything. They just have come to Christ and they're fired up about it. And what happens is all of a sudden they start bringing people to Christ. Naturally, you know who's you know who's most effective at winning lost people to Christ? Those who were just recently lost and got one to Christ. They're most effective. Why? All their friends are lost. You take somebody who's been in church 50 years and they don't even know many lost people. You don't, know yeah, that makes sense. So Let's go back to the scriptures that I was looking at. I, I know I chased a rabbit trail, but I also knew the whole way. We're coming back. We're coming back. And so we're looking in verse 19 at works, and we're looking at verse 22 at fruit. If you're there in, in Galatians 5, the works of the flesh are evident. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, notice it starts with one of those buts. The fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. So, nine fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. So, do I look at this and say, okay, ooh, I'm lacking patience. I always say I'm, I'm patient with everything except waiting. But uh, when it comes to waiting, I'm not very patient. So, <laughs> do I look at that and say, ooh, I need to, I need to work on my patience has anybody in here ever prayed for patience? I bet you have not really wanted to when you got this. <laughs> Lord, give me patience. Well, what you're going to get is a trial. That's what you're going to get. <laughs> you're going to get a trial. And you'll learn patience through that. And so when we see the fruit, what's the key? Is the, the key is that I get as close to the Lord as I can get, walk in the Spirit, and it will be a natural byproduct. But I have to protect that environment. You got with me now? Coming back to... God's poured out on me, but I have to protect that environment. My favorite parable of all Jesus' parables, and I had to change, I had to change how I said it because not everybody's from East Texas, and my mother-in-law back there thought I was saying something totally different than what I was saying. The parable of the, of the four souls, and she thought I was saying souls, and it's an obvious difference, soul and soul. <laughs> <That's an obvious. laughs> so some of y'all are still looking at me like, what did he just say? Parable of the four souls. And that is the four types of ground that the seed was thrown on. We're going to look here at Felix when he says he, he puts it off. Let's, he, he puts it off. And so we're going to come back to just keep in your mind. We're going to talk about fruitfulness again. When Felix says, come back another day. It is if you have thrown the seed on the ground and did nothing with it. You did nothing with it. The ground did not receive it. The ground was not prepared. And so when we look into fruitfulness, we have to have the right elements, but also the right environment. Everybody with me? So for self-control, as one of these fruit, and I, he just picked that one. He picked that one. Uh, Protect the environment. Now I want to look uh, at another verse of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by the fire, may be found to, to praise. I'm sorry. Hang on. Making sure I'm on the right track. It is not where I was going, but it looks good. 
The genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is detested by the fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking I need to be in Second Peter. Verse 1, yes, 2 Peter, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 5. Let's start there. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now, how did I say that you become righteous? How was Abraham considered righteous? Faith. And, and it was accounted to him as righteous. So if you have faith unto salvation, you have been declared righteous by God. Amen? Everybody with me? Can I get an amen? amen. All right. I need, to, I need to make sure you're listening with me. Everybody's, everybody getting a little sleepy at the end of the day. Don't do that. Verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So I'm adding to my salvation virtue. So there are things in my life that I'm going to alter. Add to virtue, knowledge. It's important that you know this book. It's important. You need to be adding knowledge. You don't, and that's going to come back into the parable, parable of the four souls in just a second, that you need to be adding knowledge. I, I, I had lunch today with a pastor, and I told him just how, how much it thrills me that on a Wednesday night, we will have a room of people that for a straight hour just study the word together. It thrills me. It's, this is not, uh, we're not offering anything except the, the bread of the word tonight, and yet look how many is here. Amen? It just thrills me. So this is, this is awesome because we have people who are adding virtue to faith, and then also to virtue, we're adding knowledge. Amen? We need to know more. To knowledge, self-control. There it is. We need to add that. We need to grow in that. Uh, add to self-control, perseverance. So I can control myself for a little bit, but how long? Perseverance, perseverance, godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are, are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor what? Unfruitful. Unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, coming back to this, being fruitful, what do I need to do? I need to make sure the elements continue. I need to make sure the environment is protected. All right, so how many of you have planted gardens only to plow it under because it never produced any fruit? I have. We, we would plant a garden, and then we'd go on mission trips or wherever, and we weren't there for a season and, and didn't get watered. Stuff died. But how many of us, and this is an illustration I used with some this morning as I was ministering to, how, how tragic would it be for us to plant a crop and that thing's rocking on pretty good? Man, I've been waiting five weeks for, to, to harvest this thing, and I don't have any vegetables on it, so I'm just going to go ahead and plow it under. Well, five weeks ain't long enough. I need to protect that environment and continue to make sure the elements are there. So, Christian, let us continue to walk near to the Lord with the watering of the Word, with the watering of the Word, and the Son of Jesus Christ, S-O-N, fellowshipping near with Him, and that continual fellowship, and we will be fruitful. John chapter 5 uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. If anyone abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And so we need to continue to abide in him and that we will be fruitful. Uh, thinking about John chapter 5, it's Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Um, he is then saying the natural byproduct of being connected to Christ is to be fruitful. It's not works, it's just natural as long as we are abiding, as long as we're connected to him and continuing in that. All right, um, bu -bu -bu -bum, let's go back to Acts. Let's go back to Felix. So there's Felix. Uh, Paul is, is talking to them concerning Christ, verse 24. 
chapter four, chapter 24, verse 24, Paul's talking to him about Christ. And then he gets into what he was talking about. He reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. The judgment to come. Don't forget, there is judgment coming. There is a judgment day coming. And uh, it's hard to say amen about, but it is, maybe we just say, oh, me. There is judgment. And at, at this subject, Felix, it says, was afraid. He had every reason to be afraid. He had every reason to be afraid. Paul must have known something about Felix in that he discussed self-control with him. And, uh, and, and then he goes into the judgment to come. And that every one of us will stand before a holy God one day and answer for what we did on this side of the grave. We will. Now, child of God, will you face the same judgment as Felix? You will not if you are a child of God. We have, we have references in the scripture of two different types of judgment. One is known as the great white throne judgment. And at the great white throne judgment, we have the dividing of the sheep from the goats. The dividing of the sheep from the goats. And so uh, we're not going to get into, you know, timelines and, and, and how all this happens with the rapture and all those things. We're not, we're not going to get into all these things. But we do know that there is a judgment to come. We know that there's a judgment to come and that, that the scripture says that he will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep go into everlasting reward and the goats into everlasting punishment. Those who are saved are referred to as sheep. Those who are goats are referred to as the lost. And so there's a judgment coming. Uh, we have a lot of scriptures on that. I'm just going to look real quick. <clears throat> I mentioned John 5. I'm going to look at John 5 real quick. I know I didn't give these to you, Ingrid. But uh, they all have their Bibles anyway. So John 5, John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Isn't that a relief? Because that's me. I hope it's you. I'm going to read it again. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word, by the way, I'm reading mine in red. <laughs> Jesus has said, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me. Notice him is capitalized. Who is he talking about? Who is Jesus talking about? God the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He was sent by God. He who hears his word and believes in God has everlasting life. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, believes in who? John 3, 16. Sound like both, don't it? <laughs> sound like both. Because John 3, 16, it sounds like it's referring to Jesus. And here, Jesus says he's referring to God. John 3, 16, I'm going to just go over it again. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, him who? Him, Jesus. I have everlasting life. This passage, chapter 5, verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me. Him who? God the Father. Jesus says, when you're looking at me, you're seeing the Father. Amen? You don't have to say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in God. If you're only talking about the historical figure, you can't really put your trust in him anyway. The historical, if you only are talking about the man Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago, but you don't recognize that he is the God Jesus who lives today. Does that make sense? So we'll be careful when you hear people talk about historical Jesus. No, I believe that he is God and still lives today. Amen? Amen? So you can't say, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in God. You certainly won't say. Anyway, let's get to the point. I could just talk circles around this because... He says, if you believe in me, in John 3, 16, or if you believe in him, what does Romans 10, 9 say? This is why every time we get in the baptistry, I have people, I ask them, is Jesus the Lord of your life? And 
About 50% of the time, they'll say, yes. And then what do I say? Say it. <laughs> Airtime. Say it. Jesus is Lord. It comes from Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It is absolutely essential, not that you just believe in your heart, but that you confess with your mouth. I hope that y'all have been told that. I hope that every one of us has been told that. Because I have had people tell me, well, I've always believed. Well, amen. Amen. Have you ever confessed with your mouth? Have you ever made a public profession of faith in which you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord of your life? Amen? That's what it says. Read it for yourself sometime, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And so, that we need to confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. So, in this passage of Scripture, let's get back to the point. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. I do not have to fear judgment. Amen? Amen. Amen. Perfect love casts out fear. I am in a love relationship with God the Father. I'm not, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of, of judgment. Why? Because he was already judged on my behalf. Jesus was already judged on my behalf. See why I like talking about grace and righteousness? I, I can just preach me happy. <laughs> Amen. Now, there's another judgment, though. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. <clears throat> Let's back up to verse 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, I just got scared again. Why? Because I'm, I've messed up since coming to Christ. A lot. A lot. So now I'm scared again. But I need you to understand that this word judgment, this judgment seat referred to this, referred to here, is, is the same word that would be used in a Roman Colosseum. Or, uh, 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 like when uh, the, the games, the Roman games happened. And at the end, they would bring the winner of those games to get their reward. And that's the same word. We call it the Bema seat. It's the time of reward. And so when you look this passage of Scripture up, recognize that you will receive a reward, child of God. Amen? Or won't receive a reward. What you won't receive is punishment. You got that? Please understand that. So you won't receive punishment. Different judgment. The great white throne judgment, I will come back to you, Clay. Great white throne judgment there will be punishment for those who did not receive Christ. For the sheep who did receive Christ, there will be no punishment. There will only be reward or the lack of. Does that make sense? All right, so you can breathe easy again. Clay. Okay, so we're already in because of faith. That's right. This is just determining how much. How much reward you get. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's just we're we're saved, so we don't go to the great white throne judgment. I mean, we'll be at the judgment, but we will be on the reward side, and then we will receive a reward from the Lord. So you don't have to fear punishment. You don't have to fear. You don't have to be afraid of God that He's going to smack you around and beat you down and throw you into hell. You won't find the word purgatory in the Bible. I don't know if y'all ever known that, but you won't find it. You don't have to pay off. There's no scales. We get that, right? I hope that you continue to think about that. There is no fear in love. Only those, and this is scripture, First John, 
Only those who don't understand his love for us fear God in that in the frightened way. Perfect love casts out fear. That's what the word says. Amen. So just remind yourself, because of Christ, I am now the righteousness of God. I am now in right standing with God. And remember what I said, right believing about your right standing will lead to right living. All right? So because uh, I am the beloved of God in right standing with God, I don't have to fear God. In other words, and, and let's break that word down real quick because some people really get hung up on this word. When I'm using the word fear God in that way, I mean you don't have to be afraid of him. When I say fear God in the positive way is you better respect him as God. I'm not afraid of electricity, but I sure do respect it. I love electricity. <laughs> I like that we don't have to have candles and lanterns in here tonight. I like that the air conditioner is running. I'm not afraid, oh my goodness, there's electricity all around me. But I don't go sticking my finger in the outlet. And <laughs> so I respect it. So that's, that's God. Fear, fear him in that fashion. All right. Let's get back to Acts chapter 24. Oh, I said we was going to talk about the parable of the four souls. Here we come. So he talks about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Felix was afraid, and he had every reason to be afraid. Why? Because he was on the wrong side of judgment. And he says, go away for now. When I have a con convenient time, I will call for you. Is this not a repeated tactic? How many times have I witnessed to somebody for them to say, let's come back and talk about that? Only to realize they never really wanted to come back and talk about this. It's a, it's a repeated tactic. And so Felix, he gets real uncomfortable and you, you can, when you do some soul winning, you go to witnessing people, you'll watch them get to squirming, especially when you get into talking about the judgment. I remember I had a particular incident in Africa, and uh, it was just me and the translator. And uh, we were, we'd come upon this group of guys, and I wasn't really sure what they were up to, but it didn't look right. And so, hey, there's an opportunity to witness. So there I was witnessing to them, to only find out this was a group of Muslims, and they were... I think they were, they'd been hitting the bottle a little bit, but uh, I told my, and, and then they started getting belligerent with me. It was about eight of them, I guess. And, uh, and my translator, he looked a little nervous. And I said, you say every word that I tell you to say, and do you, don't you change it. And I went to the passage of scripture where the Lord talks about separating the sheep from the goats, the sheep into everlasting reward, the goats into everlasting punishment. It got serious up in the house. I'm telling you, it got serious. But they needed to know. They needed to know there was judgment. Felix hears about the judgment. And he got afraid. And as he got uncomfortable, he said, let's, meetings, meetings adjourned. Let's not talk about it anymore. And so that's, that's kind of what happens sometimes. We see people get uh, uncomfortable with the subject of Christ and judgment. And so he says, go away for now. Verse 26, meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him for two years. Verse 27, but after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanted, uh, and, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So Paul is there in confinement for two years. Uh, we do know that Felix, uh, the reason he was removed from his position, there was an uprising of Jews, and he handled it. Uh, and there, the reason there was an uprising, because this guy was a scoundrel who liked to get bribes, as we see in this passage of Scripture. And so because he, he wasn't a good guy, the culture just kind of shifted ugly. And, and so now when we have a... a, a a mess on our hands, he goes in there and just slaughters them. And because of his activity there, Caesar pulls him, puts in Festus, and so that's kind of how this changed. Well, 
he's still thinking political, and so he kept he kept Paul in prison. But he wanted a bribe. So what does that tell us? Could Paul have given him a bribe and gotten free? Sound like why didn't he? Two years. Two years in confinement. He is a he is well known among Christians. Don't you know many of them say, hey, I'll I'll fund this thing. Let's get him out of there. Why didn't he do it? You are exactly right. Lord's already told him, you're going to Rome. You're going to Rome. And so he, he, he's not trying to get out of this deal. He's going to Rome. Now, I do want to come back to this business about putting off. Uh, I'm going to go back to the parable of four souls. Souls. Soul. <laughs> Soil. It's like saying oil. I just call it Earl. <laughs> it's Earl. Cooking Earl, motor Earl. You know what I'm talking about. So when we, <laughs> these, these, these four grounds that the seed has fallen on, what was the first one? The first one was on the roadside, the road. It was non-prepared. And because that ground did not receive the seed, what happened? The birds come in and take it, and in the reference to the birds, he even tells us the interpretation. Satan comes in and steals the word of God. Satan comes in because someone didn't receive it. They didn't receive it. They weren't ready for it. They, you, 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 you spread the seed of God's truth. They didn't receive it. Satan comes in and snatches it away. This is a good picture of Felix. I, I don't want to hear this right now. And, of course, we know he didn't get saved. All right, second one. The second one was that in the shallow soul. So the first one, he put it off, didn't receive it, put it off. Second one, shallow soul. It received it, but it put off maturing. Did not grow in depth. This is the picture of someone who gets saved. I mean, they're excited about their new salvation. But discipleship, maturing, growing in knowledge, you know, I'm going to make it to heaven. I don't need to do all that. And then the scripture says, and when the sun comes up, that seed had no root, and therefore it withered away. What's the end result of that? No fruitfulness. Third, third soul. That which landed among the weeds and the thorns. This is someone who put off removing the things from their life that hinders fruitfulness. They didn't maintain the environment. Everybody with me? Y'all kind of track it. See, I told you I was going to come up. I'll bring it full circle right back around. A move of God, that, that, hand, that works for me individually and us corporately. I, as the pastor, as a, every one of us individually must maintain the environment. Individually. I, as the pastor of this church, I am constantly, I will wear myself out trying to maintain this environment. Why did I start off saying, here are notes for faith, family, with peace. Why do I have these notes? I have these notes because my precious wife put these on a piece of paper because I told her to put these on a piece of paper. Why? Because when we come in on Wednesday night and someone's upset because the their favorite item is not on the salad bar or somebody's frustrated because they had to press through the crowd or somebody's aggravated because yada, 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 yada. Then I'm recognizing, okay, we have selfish people who are more interested in what they want than the environment. And I have to say, no, it's my job to protect the environment because when we get self-centered, and I want what I want when I want it, that's immaturity. Then someone has to come along and say, no, 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 no. That's not really all that important. What is ultimately important is that we're coming and we're getting into this, not the salad bar. <laughs> Amen. So do you see what, I really didn't mean on coming into that, but 
it was a pretty good illustration in that I'm constantly checking the environment. Every leader in the room, whatever group that you are leading, you have to constantly, constantly be protecting that environment. If it's a small group, if it's a Sunday school class, constantly checking the spiritual element that you're walking into. If you walk into it, you feel the tension, then guess what, leader? It's your job to change the environment. I have had a few occasions in which I'm preaching and I recognize there's something wrong in the atmosphere. And I stop the service. Something not right in here. Let's pray. And we take authority over the environment. And it lifts. And we go on with the service and experience freedom again. Amen? Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. The Lord brings the elements. We protect the environment. The Lord brings the elements. It's his fruitfulness. It's it's. His reign, it's his son, it's, it's the product that he's bringing. But I have to make sure I'm receiving. I have to make sure I'm weeding. He said that some landed over there in the weeds and the briars. Some, and it tells us exactly, it gives us the interpretation. And that those briars and thorns and, and weeds choked out those plants. And it says those are the cares of the world. Somebody should have come along and pulled up the cares of the world that killed the fruitfulness. Amen. Amen. Doesn't that make sense now? We, we have to protect our, the environment of our own hearts. We have to protect the environment of, the, uh, of whatever area that we're leading. And so uh, that was a good opportunity to share about the Faith Family Feast. <laughs> All right. Felix. I'm not interested in that. You then went into judgment and isn't God, doesn't God just love us all? Doesn't God just love us all? We don't need to talk about judgment. You just need to go on, Paul. Uh, I can continue whatever Felix was doing. He was, he was a scoundrel. I don't want to talk about judgment. Go on, Paul. He didn't receive. Well, there's many people who, oh, yeah, I want to go to heaven. They receive, but they don't. They don't want to do the work of maturing. Well, you're not going to be fruitful. Or they don't want to do the work of weeding those things out of their lives that are going to kill fruitfulness. Well, you're not going to be fruitful. Well, then let me just tell you this. Finally, I'm finishing up. You're created for fruitfulness. And that's where you find your greatest joy. You're created for it. And your greatest joy will be in being fruitful. And so you can be looking for joy in the world, but your greatest joy is going to be found being fruitful. So you really want it. Even though you don't know that you want it, you really want it. Any questions, comments before we wrap it up? All right. Well, this was fun. <laughs> I love it every time. I said we was going to have some group discussion, but I talk too much. So... <laughs> Maybe next time. All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your truth. And Lord, it doesn't matter who speaks it. Truth is truth. And it does not change. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you would just continue to help us manage our own lives, being good stewards of what you have given us. And that we look over it and that we, 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 Take care of those things that need to be taken care of in our own personal lives and in our areas of, of influence. And Lord, that we bring about fruitfulness. And your scriptures tell us that through that, God is glorified. And we want you to be glorified. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for all that you do. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.